up in the struggle for human rights in South Africa, she herself was involved in a number of political and community organizations and provided legal representation for political activists and represented conscientious objectors. She is the former chairperson of the Human Rights Commission Trust and is the managing trustee of the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund and she was also given an honorary doctorate by Rhodes University for her contribution to the struggle for human rights. Now, on the note of human rights, what's not in here, which I came across, which I thought is absolutely wonderful, Kathy inherited money which she has used to buy donkey carts for use in a, in a rural area to get clinics, to, to get people to clinics and to pension payout funds. And I think I'm not going to read you the last bit about the dead woman and men. She's going to tell you about it, but I think that's, that is a symbolic of where Kathy's heart lies. So please welcome Kathy. <laughs> He's got to wire you up because it's a bit wonky. Oh, okay. Just missing a clip. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you. As I say, it's a very long war, and it, the repercussions will go on and continue to go on into our lifetime. But I'm also very pleased that you are all engaging in the commemoration of the events of 100 years ago. 1917 is a very difficult year, because in 1914, everybody thought, oh, well, the war will be over by Christmas. 1915, South Africa won a great victory in German Southwest Africa, with very little loss. In 1916, South Africa had losses in German East Africa, and then gradually came to understand, as it experienced, the horrors and the disillusion of the battles of the Somme. But 1917 is somewhat different because the military command has absolutely no idea what to do. It has run out of sensible options. And so what does it do? It just keeps having more and more useless little battles and sending young men off to die for very little gain. In fact, what happens in 1917 is to set the, uh, the British and the Allies up for defeat in March of 1918, when the Germans just went through France and Belgium, and the war was very nearly won by the Germans. So it is a year of blood and mud and guts. And I appreciate that you've chosen to get your feet so dirty, instead of the art and the music and the fascination of Vienna. But I wanted this time slot of 11.15 because it will then be possible for me to meet afterwards with any of those of you who might be interested in working on preparing a summer school memorial book as I've set out in the little memorandum. And that's what I meant the other night, Glenn, about keeping you busy. You have the little diary. That should be in the book. Now, this week, oh dear, yes. This week, 1917. Today, there's a bit of an introduction because this is a very political year. And as Clausewitz said, war is politics by other means. And I'm going to do it as how the cartoonist saw it. Tomorrow is black South Africans in uniform. But I find it quite interesting that in a very strange way, when I was in France in October and November this year, I suddenly came to appreciate that actually a strange process of nation building is happening in South Africa through inclusion of blacks and whites and coloreds and everybody in a shared history of the First World War. Wednesday, we look at a nurse in Salonika and to misquote from wherever, greater love hath no woman than to lay down her life for her patients. <laughs> the Royal Flying Corps really took off in more ways than one on Thursday, and I have a soldier who, or not a soldier, an airman, whose parents put on his gravestone that he was a burnt sacrifice. And then on Friday, we have Third Ypres, better known as the Battle of Passchendaele, and the commanding general talked about the soldiers just trying to wade through thick porridge. So it was not 
will not be a pretty year. But this year is the year of politics. At home in South Africa, amongst the political and military leaders of Great Britain, in Europe, and in the Americas. And all of these politics impact upon our soldiers and their stories. Because many of the battles which took place, they were only planned and fought because of political battles taking elsewhere, as we will see. And as we know, much of what took place in 1917 had an impact on the world after the war. So I'm going to do a rather simplistic overview today of the politics behind the struggles of 1917. We're going to look at what happened in Serbia and the Balkans after the assassination of last year's friend, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. We're going to look at the collapse of the Russian Empire and the battles on the Eastern Front, the rise of Lenin. We're going to look at the United States doing its best not to get involved and finally and very reluctantly doing so. And we're going to look at why the Brits and the French were so engaged in Mesopotamia, the power of oil, and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Now, oy, oy, oy. Oy, oy, oy. <laughs> we have a little problem. Oh, yes, I may not suppose to Martian, but it is. So, you know what? I think. Let's give up on this system. Can we just do it through my computer? Yes. You know what? I think I'll just, if I turned this off. Okay, you, you just do that. Just do the one thing, which is put my hard drive onto that. And I'll turn this off if I want. If I shout more, okay. If I don't shout it, I, I just don't think the IT is great today, but hopefully it will be working tomorrow. Um, so let me do this because I'm going to do it You can turn it off, Martian. had deserted and gone off to live in London. The South Africans were involved in France and Belgium. And for me, 1917 is actually the year that is quite personal. I think of the brothers Bert and Arthur Dixon who were killed in East Africa. I think of Norman Purden, whose little photograph I managed to find somewhere in the Free State, and he just disappeared on Easter Monday at the Battle of Paris. And you'll hear on Friday how Roland Hill and Alan Purden just fell into the mud and were never found at Passchendaele in Belgium. But it was also the year, as we will discuss tomorrow, when hundreds of South Africans drowned on the Mendy. <laughs> Subsequent to the assassination at Sarajevo in 1914, war raged in the Balkans. And on Wednesday, we're going to look at the autograph album of a nurse whose patients wrote poems and drew pictures. And she then was killed in Macedonia when she was leaping onto a Serbian patient to save them from a German bomb. <clears throat> the revolution in Russia caused the Allies enormous concern this year. First, Russia faltered and then it abandoned its participation in the war. And this meant that Germany was free to withdraw its armies from the Eastern Front and it could focus and concentrate on Belgium and France, the Western Front. It was actually in a position to redouble its efforts against the French and the British. And this played a considerable part in the decision of the Allies at Easter time this year to launch the offensive at Arras, which, as we will discuss on Thursday, 
required the great help of the Royal Flying Corps and its airmen. But this concern about the Russian collapse certainly contributed to General Haig's decision to commence and to continue and continue and continue with the five month long Third Battle of Ypres, Passchendaele, which we will discover on Friday. The United States very belatedly decided to end the war in 1917, but no troops came through or performed any useful military exercises until 1918. Now, on the one hand, the Germans were very worried about, about US involvement. And so they did their best to enter the war before the Americans arrived. On the other hand, General Haig did not want to have to work with the Americans. He wrote in his diary, oh God, please let there be victory before the Americans arrive. <laughs> and he certainly did not want them to have the glory of winning the war. And this persisted in his desire to continue and continue with the Battle of Passchendaele. And finally, as we know, most wars are about power and access to resources, and this one was absolutely no different. All parties were interested in the resources of the Middle East. The South African infantry, as we know, served in Egypt in 1916. And as we will discuss tomorrow, the Cape Corps served there in 1918 and in 1919. Tomorrow, our own internal politics will be discussed because we're going to be looking at the wartime service tendered by black South Africans, the response of the South African government at the time to that offer, the uses to which South African natives were put, and the contribution which they made to the outcome of the war. And interestingly, as I've indicated, I think to the current creation of a combined historical narrative. <coughs> now, we've got enough photographs of battles of mud and craters and so on to keep us fairly blinded this year. So I've chosen today to try and illustrate the talk through cartoons and posters. And it does have its own problems. And so I thought, let's just look at some cartoons which may be familiar to us, and I can try and illustrate how I found cartoons very problematic. Here's a cartoon that resonates with all of us who are over 50. <laughs> Political cartoons use imagery and use text to comment on contemporary social issues. So we've got an apartheid cartoon, a black nanny who cares for a baby, i.e. a very intimate relationship, but she's not allowed to follow the baby's pram onto the whites only grass. We see how ridiculous and wicked it is. You see the spy who is watching from behind the newspaper. And this is the kind of cartoon that resonates today. It follows on its past, and it will exemplify apartheid, I think, for centuries to come. Some cartoons or drawings have a clear and unambiguous and often and obvious message. But as you will see from some cartoons that I'm going to show you, the message is very obscure. And I've spent hours trying to decipher them, and I've just decided to make up my own version of what they mean. And if you're going to argue with me, you develop your own version. <laughs> Look at this cartoon. We've got the caricatures of the people. Eugene de Kock of the CCB, which carried out torture, murder, terrorism, violence, and bombings. Paid by the government, he earned more than one medal. And he's pointing out to Magnus Milan and others, P.W. Boerter, F.W. Colonel Pick Boerter, that this is what they ordered. But the cartoon is actually very dated. It's from a bygone era, and I think it probably would have very little meaning to anybody under about 60. Anybody here younger? Ask the person next to you to explain. <laughs> now here's a cartoon. The genie emerges from the bottle. Now, probably most of us remember where we were, with whom we were, and what we were doing on that particular day. I doubt that future generations will remember that date. I doubt that future generations will even know who F.W. de Klerk is. But I have absolutely no doubt that the greatness of Mr. Mandela will live on. Here is perhaps a far more enduring message 
<laughs> it is not limited to one particular contemporary event, and it can be used all over the world. We have the familiar face of Archbishop Tutu. There's the play on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which we remember. He is speaking the truth, and what is the truth? The rich must help the poor. But there is a reconciliation amongst old and new elites. They both are now rich. Here's a last year's cartoon, and I think this shows us how you need some shared experiences or cultural heritage to really make sense of cartoons. We, Tuli Madoncella is not identified, because at this particular time, she is well known. But the Nkandla report is identified. We have government or party functionaries, and we all recommend the man who wears the shower head. And as we see, cartoons use symbols to highlight the theme. But we would have to, as I say, have this combined shared knowledge about Pinocchio. The more he lied, the more his nose grew. And so cartoons must be able to draw on these shared understandings, and that I have found quite difficult with the cartoons of a hundred years ago. <coughs> Something more recent, a little bit obscure, so we are told on the telephone poll that it's the Gupta family, in case we don't know that. The first one on the left has bought a president. The second one has in his shopping basket a whole government. But the third one is really complaining. He tried to buy a Minister of Finance, so we can date it to the sacking of Minister Nene, and then the appointment of the man whose name we won't ever remember. And probably this is a cartoon that's actually going to lose significance quite soon, and it's only going to be an economic student writing a thesis in about 30 years who will remember any of these details. But here's something that applies all over the world. It's classic. Cartoonists work by analogy. They compare dissimilar things. So here you've got bloated government and bloated individual. The diet for the individual and cutting back on waste and expenditure for government. So the message is made far more dramatic by comparing <coughs> unalike things. Now, what do we remember from this particular campaign? Well, in a sense, what we see is what we get, okay? But we may be disappointed. This too might fall apart and not actually be what happens over the next four years. If you watch on Friday, you will we'll learn from his speech. So what I plan to do is whisk through on a very simplistic level and just make up a lot of lies about the cartoons I don't understand before, during, and after 1917. I'm hoping to show how political satirists of the time used caricature, distortion, symbols, played on words for, to illustrate the events of that year. I've had to discard a lot of cartoons I didn't understand, and I must apologize, a lot of cartoons are very hard to see. They're in black and white on the whole, they're very faded or blurred, and the copyright holder, which is so often punch, has its name right across, which I can't <coughs> complain about. So <laughs> let's start with Europe in 1914. This is a little bit of a later <coughs> cartoon because as you can see, we've got tanks and aeroplanes. But tanks and aeroplanes were in the planning. Certainly aeroplanes were already in the air, and water tanks, as they were called, were in the planning. But the reason for this cartoon is twofold. We know we've got the symbol of John Bull, who's going to keep appearing. France is Marianne. We've got the Kaiser, who always has a moustache and a helmet. Austria-Hungary is usually the whiskered ancient emperor. Russia is always the bear, and Mahmoud with the fez is always Turkey. The cartoons are quite racist. Most of them are written, that I've got, are written from a British perspective. The German ones I really have had to make up my own message. But that's the first thing, the symbolism. The other that I want to point out is that cartoons and the politics of this particular year tend to be about how the bigger powers put pressure on the smaller powers to get involved. 
So Germany and Austria-Hungary bullied Turkey and Bulgaria. France and, Brit and Britain bullied Italy, bullied Romania, bullied Greece. But it's not just bullying people to come onto your side. It's also bullying your own side to stay in the war. It's also bullying your own side to keep other people occupied elsewhere. So we will see how France was absolutely desperate for Russia to carry on fighting there, because that would keep the Germans occupied on two fronts. It was absolutely vital for Germany to persuade Austria-Hungary to keep fighting the Serbian campaign, because Germany had for a long time desired a railway all the way through to Turkey and then down to the oil fields of Persia. And Austria-Hungary wanted to give up. And you'll see a cartoon of the Dachshund gnawing away at the emperor's legs. So there's quite a lot going on, and most of it is developed around the idea of symbols. This is a German cartoon, and this is how Germany sees the map of Europe in 1914. The Germans are worried. They face Russia, they face France. Nobody wants a two-front war. <laughs> Austria is looking at this voracious peasant of Russia. The Turks are a little bit mouth open and don't want to get involved. Serbia, rather cleverly, is piggy in the middle. Do you see the little piggy? And there is the piggy's little eye at Belgrade, which, as the Austro-Hungarians crossed the Danube, kept on being captured by different sides. Greece is doing its best at this stage to keep out of everything. According to the Germans, the French are just a mess. According to the Germans, those kilted Scots are mouth open and the bulldog Gross Britannia is occupying a very large island. All right, so what we're going to see today in the politics, we're going to look at what happens for poor old Piggy in the middle in Serbia. We're then going to look at what happens with Russia, how Russia got pressurized, not by by honor in respect of Serbia, but very much by France. We're going to look how Russia was pushed into going here, into the Caucasus, and into going up against the Turks to keep them busy. We're going to see why the Black Sea and the Dardanelles were so important, which is why Turkey was important. And then we're going to start looking at Africa. Now, as we know, if we start with the Balkans, the Balkans were the powder keg of Europe. Austria had annexed Ottoman ter territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. There were further wars which resulted in the loss by Bulgaria of a lot of its Macedonian empire to Serbia, to Greece, and Romania. And as a result, the Bulgarians hated those countries. The Russian empire was patron to many of those kingdoms. And everyone dabbled in everybody else's politics, and Austria and Russia did much destabilizing of the region. And here they are watching the pot boil over. As soon as the Archduke had been assassinated, the July ultimatum was issued by Austria, and the intention was really to squash Serbia flat. They intended a war. They really didn't want Serbia to capitulate, which is just about what it did. So there is a warning given to Russia, because the dogs of war are now unleashed by Russia, because Russia is an ally and looks after Serbia. And the warning is, take care, my man. It might be awkward if you was to let him loose. And it was very percipient warning of what happened to the Russian Empire as it became involved in this war. The French were very keen to keep the war alive as far away from them as possible. And so what we have here, here is the Emperor, the Kaiser, and the Turkish Pasha, all of them pulling up and dismembering the Balkan countries. <coughs> The French were very keen on the propaganda, and here we've got poor, tiny little Serbia being attacked by everybody else. The French were very good on the propaganda, and this particular cartoonist was used a lot 
in the United States. The, the Serbian army really was fairly well decimated, but it did not have much to decimate. It was incredibly short of artillery and rifles and kept waiting and waiting and waiting for Russia to produce some. Many of the troops had no uniforms and they wore civilian clothes and they just lacked the modern weaponry to engage in the Balkan Wars, of which they were at this stage the center. France was not a busy place in 1914. But although the Austrian army was big, the soldiers were conscripts. They were from the empire's many, many nationalities. The majority of soldiers spoke neither German nor Hungarian, which was the language of the officers. And the great majority of the soldiers had ethnic, linguistic, cultural, or religious ties with Serbia. It was not an army very keen on rushing down through Serbia. On the Western Front, the French needed Serbia to hang on. So they kept talking about our wonderful little ally, Serbia. They wanted Serbia to hang on and keep fighting so that Germany and Austria wouldn't only focus on the borders of France, but would expend men and resources on the Eastern Front. And here you have a British cartoon thinking, aha, this is a very noisy little French cockerel. But as you can see, there is a power behind that cockerel. And there behind the stone is the great big Russian bear. Made everybody very brave when they had somebody behind them to back them up. So we have the chain of allies, and sometimes this cartoon is called the link of friendship. And as you can see, the Serbian says, if you touch me, well, Austrians say, if you make a move, the Russians say, if you hit that little feather, Germany, if you stab, what, if you strike my friend, the French, and then far at the back, ho there, says John Bull. So we now have the Allies, the central parties, and they're all engaged, and the whole bit of dominoes is going to come tumbling down. Well, this was how Germany and Austria saw this campaign going. Germany in the front, Austria in the back, and for our zoo, they've kept, they, they believe that they are going to capture Russia, Rusland, and Serbia is going to be crawling between the legs. This was how they envisaged their war on the Eastern Front. It was going to be quick and easy and a great victory very soon. Well, the war raged backwards and forwards across the Danube. Belgium was captured and recaptured several times. The Austrians found that a not very difficult battle. But then things started to change. Here are the Austrians, Austria-Hungary, feet firmly planted. And the Dachshund is biting them and saying, get going, get going. You have got to work hard in Serbia. But Franz Ferdinand is a little bit worried <coughs> because now he has the Russians on his border. And he is far more worried about the Russian campaign. Well, not he, his advisors, his government. Far more worried about the Russian campaign, and he's beginning to be a little bit wishy-washy. And so now we see one of the other countries, in this case Germany, having to push its ally into, keep, into keeping on going. Because the Germans were still very keen on getting the railway line, as you will see, all the way down. And for that, they needed the Serbian campaign to be successful. They also, the Germans, needed to be able to send men and supplies down to help the Ottoman Empire. But for the Austrians, Russia was the more dangerous enemy. And they preferred to focus on that front. Well, let's get ourselves an ally. So the Tsar and the French are now trying to persuade the Bulgarian thug. The Kaiser is speaking firmly, and now you see I'm lost. I think that is Italy, but Italy has not yet been persuaded to join the war. 
So I don't know who's trying to persuade Bulgaria. Well, this is Ferdinand. And it's the Balkan question of the moment. It's no longer the Balkan troubles that go back to the 1800s. The Balkan question of the moment is, Ferdy, are you going to put your foot in, King Ferdinand of Bulgaria? And he says, well, I might stop being so neutral. And the reason he's going to stop being so neutral is because the British have lost the Gallipoli campaign. <coughs> And he now thinks that Germany is the winning side. And with the disaster in Gallipoli and the Dardanelles, King Ferdinand of Bulgaria enters the war on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary. They're both, well, the Kaiser is celebrating, and this is the boys of the Dachshund breed. Obviously, a British cartoon. But there's another take on the joining of Bulgaria. The martyred Serbs, say the French. Look, we've got Germany and Austria attacking Serbia, and Bulgaria comes up and stands, stabs them in the back. <coughs> then, of course, we've got the Greeks who are just looking on. They're not going to be able to look on for very long. There's an awful warning, and the awful warning is to Romania. The awful warning is be careful. Look what's going to happen. The eagle, the lion. But here you've got poor old the emperor of Austria lying in bed. He's feeling fairly overwhelmed. He's got Russia, Serbia, Montenegro, and now Italy. <coughs> the Kaiser's not too pleased with him. Turkey's not too pleased. What's going to happen next? Romania is going to drop right on his head. That made Queen Marie of Romania very happy. She was a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. So the allies and the permutations are beginning to grow. Now Greece is caught in the middle. John Bull is pressurizing. The Kaiser is pressurizing. And the king is not a happy fellow. In fact, he's a very unhappy fellow. This is the Prime Minister, Venezuelos, and I have not been able to discover the relevance of this leopard because I looked it up, and the national animal of Greece is the dolphin. Okay? <laughs> but anyway, the Prime Minister is on top. And look at the poor little king. He's lost his helmet, he's lost his boots, and his crown is not on his head. He was married to the sister of the Kaiser, and he was very pro-German. So in fact, rather strangely, in the south of Greece, there was no war, and in the north of Greece, the French and the British and the Prime Minister engaged in a war. So what we've now got is the map of Europe in 1915, but obviously I'm taking it fairly generally. We've got the vast Russian peasant, as perceived by the Germans, with the bottle of vodka in the pocket, not being taken very seriously. The Germans and the Austro-Hungarians focusing on Russia, okay? And as you can see, the Austrians and the Germans are the most pacific, wonderful people, gracious in female form, crowns not disarrayed, but they're also being very nasty to the Serbs. Look at the Turk over there. The Turk is actually holding the key to the lock of the entrance to the Black Sea from the Mediterranean. And look at all these silly, silly British, the Anzacs, trying desperately to get through here to open up the Dardanelles. We've got the Germans here and the French are portrayed as a toy army on a toy horse. Really nothing to worry about at all. The, G the British are only interested in money. Who cares about them? And they are looked after by their ships. So that's how, at this particular time, the Germans are perceiving events. Changes a little bit, having to push the Russians zapping 
the, Hungi the Austrians zapping the Italians. The Turk is involved, crippled France, with the soldiers hiding behind their women, okay? And John Bull carrying on fishing. <laughs> These are very delighted Bulgarians and Austrians meeting up with each other. But by the end of 1915, the Balkans had been laid waste. The Serbian position became absolutely untenable. And so there was a full retreat out of Serbia through Montenegro into Albania. The weather was terrible, the roads poor, and the army had to assist hundreds and thousands of civilian refugees. But that actually helped them because it meant the Austrians couldn't follow them because of the lack of roads, because of the terrible weather. And many of the fleeing soldiers and civilians were cared for by the Scottish Women's Hospital, which is what we're going to hear about on Wednesday. Eventually, about 150,000 Serbs got through Albania, they reached the coast of the Adriatic Sea, the British ships connected them and took them around the bottom of Greece and up to Salonika, where the campaign continued. But then the story of atrocities went on and on and on. It was an important propaganda point. And we'll see on Wednesday how it was used and used and used. But here we've got the dreadful hunt. Here we've got even more dreadful hunt. And it is said that they raped and plundered, that they burnt down villages, that they poisoned wells. There are over 600,000 Serbs were in various ways killed and decimated. The upshot of the Serbian campaign is that at the end of the day, there was about 60,000 dead on that side and about 90,000 dead on that side. And actually, from Berlin, the railway could continue all the way down. It had actually been built before the war, much of it. But the problem still existed. Germany had actually ended up with in exactly the position it did not want to be. It was fighting on two fronts. It was fighting the French and it was fighting the Russians. So the Balkan campaign and the Serbian campaign was pretty much a disaster. Now, during 1916, Allied contingents of British, French, Serbian, Italian, and Russian troops arrived. The French arrived, and Salonika was prepared for defense. And then there was an offensive in the borders of Macedonia with Serbia, with Bulgaria, a little bit of Austrians, and as we'll hear on Wednesday, Europeans. And I'm spending time on this because I find it quite strange that a woman from Germiston is buried in Macedonia, because that's the story on Wednesday. And that's why we have these British heroines of the First World War in Serbia. Because this campaign was a fairly low priority for the British. And as a result, the Scottish Women's Hospital, which was a voluntary organization, assumed a great role in Serbia, in France as well. And they treated not only wounded soldiers, but over 200,000 malarial patients. The Serbians continued to fight with the French and with the British. And the Bulgarians, the Germans, and the Austrians were most surprised when Serbia came again. They said to this little Serbian soldier, but I thought <coughs> you were dead. And then what happened was that the Germans and the Austrians and the Bulgarians did not want to continue. So here we've got the rush to Salonika, and no one is rushing. They stopped at the border with Greece. And so the Kaiser and the Emperor and the Bulgarian King are all saying, after you, after you, after you. Nobody actually wanted to cross the barbed wire and take the fight any further. They were all more concerned about what was happening with the Russians. Here we've got the very unhappy Bulgarian king <coughs> after a very successful French campaign in a town called Monastir, which we'll see on Wednesday. And the Kaiser says, don't worry, 
I've sunk two hospital ships, which also is relevant on Wednesday. We've now got the eagle somewhat flat. Austria has become a bit of a jester. Russia is moving. Italy is singing. <laughs> the Germans are hiding behind the Turks. And look at Marianne advancing forward with her bayonet. And John Bull is looking as though business as usual has always been very, very martial. The Serbians are saying to the Austrians, this is my fulfillment. I will spank you until you are very sorry. The Bulgarian king surrenders, and this deprived Austria and Germany of the guns and resources that were needed. And eventually, as we know, our king and our kaiser and our emperor are squashed but you can see Serbia, as Serbia was called in those days, is counted as one of the important allies. It is counted as a campaign that mattered and made a difference. Here we've got a different map when we look at Russia. And what's interesting about this is that the war was very personalized. Nationalities didn't really come together as nationalities in some cases. So it's the Tsar. It's the emperor. It's the kaiser. You'll see the Russian juggernaut, and we've got the Dachshund and the Dalmatian, the poodle and the bulldog. Okay. Now, as we know, Russia occupied a vast land mass, but it was backward in industry, finance, government, civil rights. Russia was doing its bit to keep the Germans busy, to help the French and the British and the Turks. And sorry, and the Turks were also kept busy by the Russians to help the British and the French, because the Russians ended up going down through the Caucasus in that direction. <coughs> the Kaiser, the Tsar, overlooked all, but not very successfully. He and his cousin William engaged in an armed race. William says, why are you building so many ships? And the Tsar says, oh, I'm just following your example, the cause of peace, you know. <laughs> but Russia was now in bed with France. Russia needed a lot of investment to modernize the country. And not only was there investment, <coughs> but we also have an alliance. The deal is, within 15 days, Russia will mobilize, and there will be a war on two fronts. That was the deal. It was one of the reasons that Russia had to stay in the war. So we have again the same chain of friendship. <coughs> Hail Russia. The Russian mobilization was able to mobilize the largest military in the world. Before the war, there were one and a half million men. They had about five million men in reserves but they didn't have enough rifles for all of them. But they appealed to patriotism, Russia first. And this is actually Russia saying, for the sake of cause and liberty, and these are what are called the dissenters. In other words, the protesters. Rally around our country and give up your claim for some kind of rights. The Allies are all together, and Russia now invades. Russia goes into East Prussia, and it is destroyed at Tannenberg, and this gives General Paul Hindenburg a great victory, which gives him much power and authority in the 1930s and enables Hitler to come to power. The Russians more successfully march into Austria, and because that is a victory, then the victory is proclaimed. And here you have the Russian bear holding in its grip the Austrian army. It didn't last long, but here is Russia spanking both the Kaiser and the Emperor, and so we proclaim victories and we deride the losses. <coughs> Unfortunately, the Kaiser was watching for the coming of the Cossacks, and here they are, rather like the Assyrians coming down like a wolf on the fold. And so he got everybody together and he turned his attention to the Russian front. The problem with the Russian front 
was that this offensive turned into a rout of the Russian army. And you have got the Tsar very worried. He's not too worried on the other front because he's doing quite well against the Turks where the Germans had wanted him to go. So he's fighting the Turks with the Kaiser doing all the talking and it seems as though the emperor is praying. But the Russians chased off the Turks. The French were very keen that the Russians keep going even though things were difficult. And they needed the Russians to keep going because of the enormous pressure on the French army at Verdun. The Germans were bleeding the French dry in 1916. The losses were terrible, 800,000. And so the French desperately needed the Germans' attention to be on Russia. But things were not good as we know in Russia. There was internal discontent, and the Tsar was most uneasy and beginning to be aware of it. The Tsar's German wife was mistrusted, A, because she was German, and B, because she was thought to be so dependent upon Rasputin. The Tsar himself was seen as dancing to Rasputin's tune. People in the Russian um Empire were brutally subjugated, it was thought, in the interests of the Orthodox Church and the royal family. And of course, anybody who dissented was put in chains and taken off to Siberia. All political protest was crushed. And so on Women's Day, February 1917, 90,000 women workers in the city of Petrograd left their factory jobs and marched through the streets. And they were not alone in demanding change because, change because the next day, double that number of men and women did the same thing. By the end of February, the city of Petrograd was shut down and the Tsar, as you can see, was on his way out with his portrait onto the fire. And his abdication in March was not much mourned. As you can see, Mark Twain was feeling himself, if he'd been there, very willing to give the Tsar a shove of his throat. The Germans had a clever plan. Their worry was as follows, that Russia would continue fighting. So what they did was they got a sealed train to drive through Germany from Switzerland because they believed that Lenin would end the war if he got to Russia and took power. Because they wanted him to end the war, they would then not spend time in the East and they could turn all their attention as they did in 1918 to the West. And Lenin believed that the Russian people were ready for another revolution. At the head of the Bolsheviks, they took control of the telegraph stations, power stations, bridges, etc. They overthrew the provisional government. And as a new room, Lenin announced inter alia that the new regime would end the war, which is exactly what Germany had planned. Now, things weren't that easy. This is an anti Bolshevik cartoon. It's either the church or the Tsar that is about to be dreadfully stabbed by all these mental patients and, of course, the dreaded Lenin. You can see we've got a Judas who's been paid 30 pieces of silver and a lot of fairly mental um, soldiers and sailors. But the point is, there was an anti-Bolshevik movement. We know that the White Army went on for quite a while. In fact, South Africans were fighting in Russia in 1919 as the Russian Civil War continued. And so because of the Civil War, there was enormous pressure on the Bolsheviks. They really couldn't have a Civil War and continue to fight the Germans. And so they formed under Trotsky their own Red Army, and then they did a deal, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, with the, the Germans. And as you can see, it is thought that effectively the Russian bear gave away all its household goods and put it into the German moving van. It was a bad deal, but they really had very little choice. 
Germany could now turn its attention to the Western Front. And the war, well, the casualties are difficult to know, but it's thought that approximately two million Russians and Germans were killed on this front. But let's now look at the Ottoman Empire that keeps being mentioned. We've got Turkey in Asia, Turkey in Europe. The Russians really want to swim in the, out of the Black Sea and through here into the Mediterranean. John Bull is holding firmly onto its interests in North Africa and particularly the Suez Canal. So Turkey is very, very central to a lot of people's <coughs> interests. And as we've seen before, remember, Turkey is holding the key here. So Russia needs a warm water port, because right up here it's frozen all year round. So the Gallipoli campaign happens, and it's not successful, and everybody is very unhappy. Now this is not a cartoon, but it's just to show you how much land, peoples, territories, civilizations, the Ottoman Empire controlled in its heyday. At the time of this war, it's only controlling here, okay? Egypt, mainly controlled by the British. Italy, France, France. So you can see the big powers have been divvying up what interests them, okay? And it's here that we have battle, and now we have battle all through Mesopotamia and into here. Why? Well, the Suez Canal, the Persian Gulf, oil, and access to India. Remember I said the Kaiser was very keen to go from Berlin on his little railway and all the way down to Constantinople. He had visited Constantinople, he'd visited Jerusalem, he'd visited Damascus. He had actually built much of his railway and he had proclaimed himself protector of all Mohammedans. And they all said, thank you very much. <laughs> so that was before the war. When the war came, here is the Kaiser in his train going to the Persian Gulf, or so he hopes. Well, really, everybody was still trying to fill up their imperial and colonial grab bags. And they were all in it. The French and the British had been particularly good at it for years and years. And as you saw, they had divvied up all around the Mediterranean for themselves. But the British were particularly good at sucking the oil dry out of various territories. And that's what this part of the war is really about. So the Tsar stuffs the Turks into the artillery gun, and that's why you've got his master's voice, with Turkey saying, what's in it for me? The Tsar drives the Turkish donkey. After the Gallipoli campaign, when the Australians and the New Zealanders, New Zealanders are sent home, the Turks are very pleased and very happy. But the Kaiser is not pleased. It really suited him, the Churchill and his navy and the Anzacs were very, very busy in the Dardanelles. It took pressure off the Kaiser on the Western Front. So not everything always went well. The Kaiser focused on the Western Front. Omp is a, is a river in France, and here is Mesopotamia. The last crusade happens. Because of the threats to British interests, the British don their crusading arm uh, gear and off they go into Mesopotamia. The poor old junior partner again, the Turk has to fight in Mesopotamia. He is rushing off on his camel to Jerusalem. And they use people such as Lawrence of Arabia to incite the various countries, the various tribes, the various sects. In fact, it was quite interesting. The British proclaimed the independence of Kuwait. They blockaded Syria. They recognized the king of Arabia. They entered Damascus, ending 400 years of Ottoman rule. And as we know, Arthur Balfour signed the Balfour Declaration, for which he was called Arthur Kurdazion, 
as opposed to Richard the Lionheart, because of trying to involve on the side of the Brits those who were living in Palestine. We've got the passing show on the way to Jerusalem. Everybody is going backwards and forwards. And the riddle of the sands is where to next, says the camel, and nobody really knows. The Turkish Pasha, Pasha enters into armistice negotiations, but he's feeling rather left out as he sits behind and everybody else does the divvying up. And nobody's really saying to Turkey, what would you like? And at the very end, you've got the bear and the lion over the Egyptian crocodile as they do their divvying up. And the last political campaign I want to look at is that of the United States. We've got France, England, Germany, Russia, and Turkey. And they're all waving swords and waving guns at each other. But sitting quietly and safely across the sea is Uncle Sam. And it was a very difficult time for the United States government. Uncle Sam is tied up in isolationism. But you can see on the one hand, help them, help them, go and help, get involved. Do nothing, do nothing. And people felt, felt very strongly one way and t'other. On the one hand, save Serbia, our ally. Send contributions to the Serbian Relief Committee. Look at the wicked that the Austrians are doing on the women of Europe. On the other hand, America first. And the fight against foreign war has begun. There will be a vote on neutrality and there is still time to keep out. <coughs> it really went both ways. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. You will see is a sensational anti-war song that I bet you could all sing if I encouraged you. Here we've got real life. A German is writing a letter to his majesty. And he says the number of bombings, the number of factory arsons that he has managed to arrange on behalf of the German Empire in Chicago. So people were very nasty to German Americans at the time. Other loyal Americans were hanging or being prepared to hang the dreadful Hun. Some said there's a bit of hypocrisy going on. You proclaim peace on earth and goodwill to men, but then you go around selling arms and ammunition. Wake up America, civilization calls. And through all this, President Wilson kept very, very quiet. He was a bit of a wimp. And so here he is steering the ship clear of the rocks, not getting involved in the war, not intervening, 